Good evening. Good evening. It is so good to be here. I was telling somebody, it feels like it's only been a couple months since we were here last, which it was. Uh, I have developed a, a lot of really close friends up in here, and you know, it's just good, good, good to be back in here. I was uh, told when I was uh, asked to do this, I could teach you anything I wanted to, which is really dangerous because I got a lot of stuff that I can teach on. <clears throat> I am one of those people that ask questions that rather than just reading the Bible and sailing through it, I tend to stop and say, what is that? Who is this Herod dude? And why is he so intent on capturing the, the new baby? I am not prepared to talk of Herod today. That's somebody else. But somehow I'm thinking there are seven, twelve, something like that, of the Herod family scattered through the Gospels. And it's probably about time for me to teach on Herod again. Uh, where I'm looking at the Pharisees. You go from Old Testament to New Testament, all of a sudden there's these Pharisee people. Who in the world are Pharisees? They're religious leaders. They are of the political party. And you say, who? So that's what I'm doing at BBI this year. So that's a plug for BBI. Maybe not my class, because I have no material assembled yet. So it's, I may not have anything to say when you come. So no, I would appreciate having you in my class at BBI. But when I was asked, you know, whatever you want, my mind instantly turned to a topic I did at BBI, as I mentioned in Sunday school this morning. I thought that I just did it not long ago, and I looked, and I taught it in 2020. And so I figured it's probably long enough ago that uh, even if you happen to be in my class, you may have forgotten something in the last 22 years. And so we're going to take a look at that today. And the reason that I find it so intriguing is because when we read the Bible, and I've we have, we're, we're doing Bible school tonight. Now, Bible school, by definition, should be something about the Bible and something we learn, right? So we're doing school on the Bible. And one of my issues is that we generally, when we study the Bible, we get focused so tightly in. We are given, you know, Colossians 1, 3 through 7. And we get focused in. And my mind goes all over the place. Who are the Colossians? Colossi what? Well, why is, who? What is going on here? And one of the most intriguing things in my studies as I went through this over the years <clears throat> was when I realized, okay, so, so let's just do New Testament for now. So we have what? And, Probably somewhere or somebody is learning that this week because this is what you teach the young people. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So why are there four Gospels? Why not just one Gospel? Why, why not just one big story of Jesus? Because they're all aimed at different people. Matthew is aimed at the Jews, which is kind of funny because Matthew was the tax collector, the one who was uh, hated by the Jews. But if you want to go for a look at the prophecy of Jesus and Old Testament verses that apply to Jesus, go to Matthew. Because Matthew has a lot of those. Mark, which we'll actually talk about a little bit, I think, later tonight yet, was aimed at the Romans. And Mark was supposedly dictated by Peter. Mark, John Mark, wrote down the book of Mark and the book of Mark shows all of what you would expect Peter to write down. Peter is one of these people that uh, somebody said he's ambidextrous, he can stick either foot in his mouth. I'm Peter, I can do that as well. And Peter was one of these people that blurted things out. That, that was mentioned this morning in the sermon that uh, he's up on the Mount Transfiguration. And I love this verse where it says that Peter said because he didn't know what else to say. Y'all ever been there? Where there's this silence, you feel like you gotta say something. And so Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration said, you know, maybe we should like build little houses for everybody. <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't even respond to that. Jesus didn't even, he said, just didn't say a word. He just, he just moved on to something else. 
And so that's the Book of Mark. The Book of Mark is this really fast-moving book. That's why it's the shortest book in, in the New in the of the Gospels. And it's by Peter, written down by John Mark. Luke is a lot of that. And okay, so the Book of Luke starts off by by saying, you know. To, to my friend Theophilus, and so here's the things that are happening. And then at the end of Luke comes Acts. And the book of Acts starts off saying, my former treatise I've written to you of Theophilus. And so the thought being, and we're going to talk about this uh, tail end probably on Thursday, where Luke is traveling with Paul, and if you remember that story, Paul is traveling down through, gets to Jerusalem, he's arrested, so what's Luke doing? Luke is chilling for the entire time that Paul's in jail. Because when they start and they go back to Rome, where they have the shipwreck, and then Paul, at the end of Acts, winds up in Rome, Luke is just chilling in Jerusalem. So what's he doing in Jerusalem? He's apparently writing the book of Luke. So who is left to interview in Jerusalem to get the details? The women. The book of Luke comes from the women's perspective as he is putting together the story of, of Jesus and the Gospels. And so that is where the Christmas story comes from. That is where at the cross, you see all of the women at the cross. It's a story that Luke picked up from interviewing the women. And apparently Luke finished the book of Luke about the time that they went and traveled over to Rome, and he worked in the book of Acts, and if you look at the end of the book of Acts, and that's kind of a funny ending, the book of Acts finishes up by Luke saying, and Paul spent time in the house, and end. Because that apparently was when the book was finished. Did he write another book? Who knows? Did he intend to write another book? Nobody knows. The book of John was written because the Apostle John, who lived, he, John was the only one that died of old age, of, of the 12 apostles. The, 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 God, the writer John looked and said, you know what? It is all cool what those three say, but there's missing pieces. And so that's what John did. John put in missing pieces. So we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Trivia question. I'm really bad for discussions. There won't be a huge amount of discussion here. So when we get beyond the book of Acts, how are Romans through Jude arranged? What, what's the arrangement on those? If you, if you have the, the preacher calls out a verse and you're trying to find it in your Bible, how are they arranged? Most mostly true, yes. They, they are the, the, break, the ones that Paul wrote longest to shortest, and the ones that Paul didn't write longest to shortest. So if you're looking for Philemon, you find Hebrews hanging left, and it's right there. If you're looking for Jude, Revelation, and it's right there. So they are longest to shortest. But again, one of the things that was probably the biggest revelation to me when I began to study all of this years ago was the, that the understanding that in the book of Acts are the letters. You can go through the book of Acts and you can take a little red marker and you can mark down, this is where Galatians was written. Go a few chapters further, this is where First and Second Thessalonians were written. And a little further on, and say this is where Romans was written. So you can go through the book of Acts and you can check off in your Bibles, this is where the letters were written. So, let's dig in. Suppose you're cleaning out the attic and discover a box of old letters. What questions are you going to ask as soon as you open up and say, man, there's a big box of letters. What are you going to ask? Who sent them? Who sent these letters? Who were they written to? Why are they written? <laughs> How old are they? <laughs> or is there any good gossip in here? <laughs> Something about grandma that we didn't know about. So who wrote the letters? 
and it was someone you didn't know, well, what was the person like? You, you, you buy a house and you open up this box. He said, I, we bought the house from this person, but what are they like? Who were they written up to? If you don't know them, what were they like? Why were they written? Are they love letters? Are they legal letters because somebody was uh, in legal trouble? And what are they about? And why were they saved? Why, why are these things in a box in the attic of the house that we just got anyway? So let's take a look at that and kind of apply that to Paul's letters. There wasn't a real organized reason to save Paul's letters. <laughs> It appears that Paul is probably a prolific writer. It appears that Paul just wrote lots and lots of stuff. The reason that Luke doesn't record the writing of any letters is probably is that common. You know, it's kind of, kind of like my writing down Brenda took, uh, you know, wrote in her diary again tonight. And she wrote it again tonight because she always writes in her diary. And apparently Paul was writing letters that often that Luke didn't bother saying that Paul was writing a letter and sent a letter because it just happened all the time. And we're gonna get into this. There's definitely at least four or five Corinthian letters that we know about. Because there's a couple times when he says, the previous letter I wrote to you, which I just a minute here. This, this is the first letter we know about. Clement, one of the early church fathers, writes of Paul's letters to the Philippians with a plural on there. And there's theories on some of the letters actually being more than one letter. F.F. F. Bruce thinks that 1st and 2nd Thessalonians are reversed. 2nd uh, Corinthians, there are some people that think that 2nd uh, Corinthians is actually two letters that somehow ran into each other. Here wrote them. Well, we're studying the letters of Paul, so we can assume Paul wrote Paul's letters. Uh, and here was Paul. He was a Jew. And we're going to take a close look at Paul, uh, Paul the man. And because without understanding Paul the man, you can't really understand Paul the letters. He was a Jew who was the first to spread Christianity to full Gentiles. And we'll talk about that momentarily. A lot of his letters deal by necessity of people trying to push Jewish law onto the Gentiles. And I think that was mentioned a little bit this morning about the whole idea of circumcision. And we'll be talking about circumcision some uh, this week. Uh, because we have these issues where Paul is going along teaching the gospel, and then somebody else comes along following Paul and says, well, you know, what he said was great, but you also need to do this. Galatians, his first letter, his main focus is Jewish law. By his second to last letter, it's still a problem. Titus was his second to last letter, and in Titus, Paul writes, there's also many rebellious people, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So even at the very end, people were still following around, telling people that Paul really was only teaching a partial gospel. Now, Somebody said that when you start a new church, make sure you go right in the first service because you'll be doing that the rest of your lives. And some of you, now you guys are a little less tradition bound up here than others sometimes. But the, I mean, there's just nothing like breaking tradition. As you, back when, when we, in our church, we used to have a long sermon and a short sermon. I often thought about, man, above that situation, I would go up and I would do the short sermon first. I, I would, preach for 10 minutes and sit down. And everybody would be just, what's going on here? And then the second person would stand up and preach for 40 minutes. And so what's wrong with that? But it breaks tradition. Uh, COVID has really messed with our love feasts, right? As we have all this stuff that is just different. Everybody, I'm not sure if that's right. You can't quite do that. Uh, Jesus was very sketchy in his directions before he left. He, he didn't say that we are supposed to establish churches that meet on a regular basis. He didn't say, write down a history of what happened. That seems to be what happened fairly late. Where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all saying, you know what? We thought Jesus was coming back like next week or next month. Maybe we should write some things down because we may not be around when this happens. Uh, he didn't say appoint leaders. 
He didn't say save the letters of those leaders so that people later would know what's going on. And it was only slowly the church figured out where things were supposed to go, and it began as a purely Jewish movement. They had no idea at the time of Jesus that this was supposed to be, you know, as they go back and they look at it, you know, when Jesus said, you know, go into all the world. And, you know, these things came back slowly as the disciples are saying, you know what? All the world is bigger than Israel. And if we're going to go into all the world, that means that everybody is not going to be Jews. Okay, so first came the Western Jews. So all of the disciples were Eastern Jews. Uh, so we have Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew. Those are all good, solid Jewish Eastern names. So what was the difference between the Eastern Jews and the Western Jews? Remember Old Testament, where the Babylonians picked up Daniel and company and took them to Babylon. And then we think about Nehemiah, Ezra, and all of them coming back, except they didn't. A large number of those Jews did not come back. A large number of them stayed in Babylon. Or they were captured. One of the ways that the Jews were scattered was that they would be taken in slaves as slaves say to Rome, there'd be a war and they'd be slaves taken to Rome. And Jews made really, really lousy slaves. Because, you know, the, your ruler would say, okay, I need you to go clean the bathroom. And they would say, ah, that's unclean, I can't touch that. Okay, so tomorrow I want you to do this. And they'd say, oh, well, you know, that, that's uh, the first day of Passover, I can't do that then. And they made really, really lousy slaves because they had all this stuff they wouldn't do. And so finally they'd say, okay, go, you're a lousy slave, and they would say, well, do we really like it here? And so the biggest cities for Jewish population were Jerusalem, Rome, Alexandria, Egypt, because of how many Jews were worldwide. But they became the Western Jews. They were the ones that had slightly different roles and they met slightly different, and they spoke in Latin, not Hebrew, when they did their services. And so all of the original disciples were good, solid Eastern Jews, the ones that Jesus picked up, and the Western Jews followed, which was all cool. Then we ran into problems, Acts 6.1. Now these days were the disciples increasing in number of complaint by the Hellenists, who are these? These are the Western Jews. They're, they're Jews, but they have slightly different practices, and they didn't come from Israel because their widows are being neglected in the daily distribution. Whether, whether that was right or not, I'm not sure, but it sure felt that way because they were collecting money, all the, everybody's putting their money together, and they were taking food, taking it to the widows, and some of the Western Jews were saying, well, the Western Jews aren't, they don't have the friends in the leadership, and they're just not getting serviced as much. And so the disciples said, you know what, guys? We're not here to serve tables. We've got enough issues with spreading the gospel without figuring out if, you know, these guys versus these guys are getting the same amount of stuff. And so they said, let's appoint deacons. Acts 6, 5, and what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. You notice these names. These are not Simon and, you know, Matthew and all these good, solid Jewish names. These are Western names. These are all Western Jews. They, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and lay their hands on. One of the things I don't have in here, uh, but it's just of note. So when we, in this city, there, there's lots of churches. And one of the reasons that our churches are split is by our beliefs, right? That they're split up by, you know, what, what we believe here and what we do with this and what we do from this and what we do from this. And if we were to ever get persecuted, I believe, our churches would pull together rather than fight against each other. But what do you do if you're Jewish and everybody believes the same thing? Well, one of the things that they had as an issue was that uh, one of the rules, and I don't want to get into Pharisees much, 
but you couldn't get more than a thousand paces on the Sabbath day because going more than a thousand paces was work. So the churches or the, or the synagogues were, were, were located based on less than a thousand steps away. And then when you get into a big city like Jerusalem, they would be split up by occupation and by other things. To me, that's cool. So let, let's all start a church of the dairy farmers. <laughs> let's do a church of the carpenters and a church of the bakers. And everybody can, you know, meet in your church and then you exchange recipes when you're done because you all agree with each other. If you go back and do a little bit of research on Stephen, it said that Stephen was a member of the synagogue of the freedmen and the Cilicians, I believe. So freedmen is someplace else. But the uh, Stephen and, Paul and, and Saul would have gone to the same synagogue, which is where they clashed originally. Okay, so first came the Western Jews, so it spread from Eastern Jews to Western Jews. Then it spread to the Samaritans. The Samaritans were, and you all know the history of the Samaritans. The Samaritans go back to the Old Testament where you have the, the northern and southern kingdom, and the, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. Southern kingdom was taken into captivity. Southern kingdom came back, and they were harassed by these Samaritans who were kind of a mix of Gentile and Jew. And the Samaritans and the Jews had a real hatred for each other, but they were still brothers. And so when Philip went into Samaria, uh, Acts 8, 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowd that wanted or paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs about what he did. So Philip went, the, the disciple, sorry, the apostle, the deacon Philip, went into Samaria and preached the gospel. And the apostles in Jerusalem heard that and they said, hold it, just a minute. Are Samaritans allowed to become Christians? And so they got their heads together and they sent Peter and John, the leaders, and they said, check it out, see, see what's happening here. And they came down and prayed for the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit. This is kind of the test. For yet, he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they began to speak in tongues, and they said, oh, cool. The Samaritans are also allowed to accept Christ. So next step, as things spread out from the original Eastern Jews, is that, remember the vision where Paul is in the rooftop sleeping. For the preachers, a good uh, series of sermons you could do is things Peter slept through. Peter slept through an amazing number of things, including he was sleeping on the rooftop, waiting for dinner, dreaming about food. And he had this vision of a blanket coming down with all this unclean food on, and a voice saying, eat. You know, Peter, take and eat. And Peter said, I can't do that. <coughs> And so, Cornelius was a God-fearer. So here's what a God-fearer was. So a proselyte, if you want to become a proselyte, remember uh, Nicholas is called a proselyte in that former slide I showed. So if you want to be a proselyte, you learn the law, give a sacrifice in the temple, and you are circumcised. If you want to be a God-fearer, you eliminate that part. So the God-fearers were ones that learned the law, they sacrificed the temple, they often were, were like, gave a lot of money. And so, so they gave financially a lot. And remember the story that Jesus, there was a, uh, a young, young man who uh, was on the verge of death. They came up to Jesus and said, his master has given lots of money and he's, provided for the synagogue that is here. And so he would have been a god fearer. So these god fearers learned the law, gave a sacrifice in the temple, but they were never circumcised. And so those were the god fearers. And so Peter very painstakingly went through and decided, okay, so that is also permitted. Now, one of the things to understand 
We often talk about or think about speaking in tongues. Where does speaking in tongues fit in here? Speaking in tongues originally was a sign of the Holy Spirit. So the Western Jews and the Eastern Jews spoke in tongues. When Philip came into Samaria, they spoke in tongues. Peter to Cornelius and the god fearers they spoke in tongues. So it was a sign that it was okay, that the gospel could come to these people. So when Peter went back to Jerusalem, the, the apostles and brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. Now the God-fearers who aren't circumcised. And the Jews are beginning to feel like this whole thing is kind of falling apart. It's getting out of their control. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. Again, this is the same party that is going through the whole way up through Titus, like I talked about earlier, saying, you know, we really need to be doing more Jewish stuff. So you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began to explain to the Lord. I had a vision. Cornelius had a vision. They spoke in tongues. And they had to all say, okay, it's all cool. Okay, so first came the Western Jews, then the Samaritans, then Cornelius and the god fears, and then Paul went to the Gentiles and the Council of Jerusalem. So that's kind of where we're going through here. And then fifthly, this is where it got really personal, and this is what got Paul in jail, was the accusation against Paul that he was teaching Jews that they didn't have to circumcise their children. Think about that as a conservative group of believers here. Okay, so it is okay for somebody to say not wearing a covering is fine. You can be a Christian without wearing a covering. We have no problem at all with that. But if they were to go up to your daughter and say you don't have to wear a covering, then we take that a little personally. And so this is where Paul got into trouble. Uh, uh, okay, so... This is at the very end of Paul's ministry as we have recorded in the book of Acts. And Paul is heading down to Jerusalem and he meets the Jerusalem leaders. And in Acts 21, 19, he said, after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So he's talking about Corinth and Ephesus and Philippi and all those places. And when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, you see, brothers, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They're all zealous of the law and they have been told about you, that you teach all of the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children. That's where it got really personal. So we have this whole thing going down through saying what is acceptable to be a Christian at the very tail end is the thing that says even Jews don't have to be circumcised. Up until then, they kind of said Jews have to be circumcised, non-Jews don't have to be circumcised. But the accusations against Paul, where you're teaching that Jews don't even need to be circumcised. All right. After, although Paul was called a missionary to the Gentiles, he never lost his love for the Jews. He would always preach first at the synagogues, he continued to go back to Jerusalem for vows and to touch base with the leaders. He made a major effort to collect money and try and bring the Gentiles closer to the Jews. We're going to be talking about that through the week. He took risks to go to the temple and try and mend differences. Again, that's what got him arrested. When these uh, Jews in that last slide I showed went to Paul and said, we think that if you went to the temple and you sponsored a couple people that are giving sacrifices there, it would encourage the conservative Jews that you haven't totally fallen off the deep end. And Paul took that risk and wound up getting arrested and sent to Rome. And he shows his concern in Romans, for example, in Romans 11, 3 through 14, 13 through 14. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, insomuch then as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I glorify my ministry in order to make my own people jealous and thus save some of them. To say that, you know, maybe just by doing that I could save some more Jews because the Jews were always at his heart. 
Paul's not a marginal Jew, but a mainstream Jew, one of the bright young scholars who was considered the future of the Jews. He apparently came from a wealthy family. It seemed like some of that wealth remained while he was still in prison. He was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the top rabbis at the time. He was educated in the academies of Tarsus. He could quote from the Cilician philosophers when in Athens in Titus 1-2. We see it was one of them, their very own prophet, who said, Christians are always liars, vicious brutes, and lazy gluttons, which was, he was a direct quote of the Christian poet, uh, Epitomies. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay, now this brings up an interesting question, which I'm not gonna dwell on today, but you can kind of steal on this one. So, Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. What happened to Paul's wife? Now this is only Monday. You have to put up with me four more days, so don't kick me out. My theory is that Paul's divorced. My theory is that Paul, who had this nice conservative wife, had his wife walk away from him. There was nothing Paul could do about it, and Paul lived single the rest of his life because his wife walked away from him. And that was one of the things that Paul sacrificed to become a Christian, because he was a member of the Sanhedrin. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you have to be married. So his wife maybe died. But on the other hand, as a conservative Jew married to the Apostle Paul, there's a good possibility she has walked away from him and had nothing to do with him. He was a Roman citizen, as was Silas, which helped him move freely around the empire. And he was a bundle of energy to be aimed where he wanted him. How many employers here would prefer having somebody who's a bundle of energy that occasionally runs the wrong direction, you have to pick them up and aim them in the right direction, as opposed to having an employee where you have to say, okay, move, 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 go. I'd have both. I would much rather deal with the employee that occasionally does the wrong thing than the employee who never does anything. And you have to keep constantly saying, move, get going, get doing something. The Apostle Paul was a bundle of energy, though, when he was struck down in Damascus. God picked him up and aimed in the other direction and said, you are going the wrong direction. Why are you kicking against the goads? And it shows up in his letters where he often breaks into mid-thought or mid-sentence. And it's really interesting when you start to study the God of the epistles. And Paul is writing something, and all of a sudden he just gets totally sidetracked. He gets, and we're going to, I don't know, mid to late week, we're going to get into 2 Corinthians, where we have what's called the Great Digression, where Paul is going along, and he's talking about Titus, and how worried he was about Titus, because Titus didn't show up. He goes three chapters on something else, and then next verse says, but then, glory be on, on glory, I met Titus. He's like a sidetrack. You know, if he had a word processor, you'd kind of take that chunk and pick it up and dump it someplace else, and you'd have everything neatly squeezed together. But his energy shows up in some of these places in here. It appears that Paul's ministry actually began his home in Tarsus. So at Damascus, he was struck down as he's on his way to Damascus. He spends three years in Arabia. So he is out in the desert for three years. We know little about that ministry. That seems to be a ministry where Paul is just kind of thinking. He's restructuring his mind. The Bible is an interesting thing for time. Every once in a while, I'm struck by time. Suppose I were to tell you that you need to take a three-year break. Dude, a three-year break? Seriously? Paul spent three years in Arabia just reanalyzing all of the scripture he knew, saying, yeah, that fits Jesus. And that fits Jesus. And maybe the things that I believe here are not actually biblical. Maybe there's some of my Pharisee teaching. So he spent three years rebuilding his faith under Jesus rather than under legalism. He went back home to Tarsus and began to preach there. Tarsus is where the church sent him to escape Jerusalem shortly after his conversion. 
So in uh, Acts 19, 28, so he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenists, with the Western Jews, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Just go, go back home. Uh, in Galatians, he says, Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, that would be Tarsus, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. But they only heard the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. One of the things that really strikes me whenever I make these studies is we are so used to our technology. We are so used to, you know, I need to get here. I, I now have a GPS that I can say, hey, Google, you know, what, what do I have? I, I have a Garmin. Hey, Garmin, Ashley 2022, since she moved, she's Ashley 2022. And he said, do you want to go there? And I said, yes. And it navigates me, and I follow it up, and it takes me the whole way up. The whole concept of having Paul up there, and how do you know? You can't check his Facebook. You can't call him by, on his cell phone. You just kind of get rumors. And they start to hear by rumors that the, the one that used to be persecuting is now not preaching the faith. He almost had to have undergone a lot of persecution there since there's little other time. So that when in 2 Corinthians he's talking about his, the times he's persecuted, and again, 2 Corinthians is one that fits into our book of Acts, so we kind of know the time frame there. And so prior to 2 Corinthians, he says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. And so when you hear about the 39 lashes, that's a three-banded whip with 13 stripes. So you, you whip them 13 times with a three-banded whip. And 2 Corinthians was only written nine years after the start of the first missionary journey. There's just not much time in there. So it's thought that these whippings probably happened when he was in Tarsus. Uh, it also would have been in Tarsus that he saw his vision. Again, there's no other time. There's no other, other space. Where he says in 1 Corinthians 12, he said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. So if you remember from the last slide, it says that his first missionary journey began nine years before 2 Corinthians, 14 years prior, where are we? 14 years prior, would have taken him back to his Tarsus ministry. So he was back in Tarsus when he saw that vision. And I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard the inexpressible things, things were not permitted to tell. 2 Corinthians was written about 56 AD, which would place the vision in 42 AD, which would put him in Tarsus. Okay, now we're getting a little closer to actually talking about the letters and uh, where Paul started to write. So once again, they started to have Jews, Gentiles become Christians in Antioch. So the church sent Barnabas, one of the leaders up to Antioch, and said, hey, what is happening? You know, this thing really seems out of our control. And Barnabas went to Antioch and found a growing church. And he said, man, I need help. And he went to Tarsus for Saul. Acts 11, 22. Now, news of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotions, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Again, the whole logistics of this. I mean, Barnabas didn't say, you know what, I need Saul. And he says GPS for Tarsus, got in his car, and you know, drove a day and a half. You know, sent Paul a text and said, hey, dude, I need you. And Paul said, okay, fine, I'm you know, in this town over here, come over and pick me up. Somehow or the other, Barnabas had to probably by land travel up through weeks, months, I don't know, got to Tarsus and said, hey, where is Saul? I kind of need Saul. And they said, well, you know, 
Saul is over in this next country over here, and he went over and he said that the Greek terminology says when he had found him, kind of concludes that it wasn't just an easy thing where he drove into Tarsus and said, hey, Paul, get in the cart, we're heading back to Antioch. So this is the point at which Paul really comes in the scene of the church. He would have been about in his mid-twenties when he became a Christian. He became a Christian about three years after Pentecost. And that's another thing that's a little hard to understand when we look at a lot of parts of the Bible is getting stuff together. As, as we look at stuff at the time before that, you know, when you look at that, somehow it seems like it should have been longer after Pentecost, but maybe not. But just, there's just a three-year gap between Pentecost and Paul being struck down on the road to Damascus. He was in his late 30s in his first missionary journey. He was about 40 when he wrote Galatians. He was about 50 when he arrived in Rome, which would have been the end of the book of Acts. And late 50s when executed by Nero. And I'm looking across the room here and thinking, how many of you is this strike? Late 50s when executed by Nero. Yet for love's sake, I'd rather be seeking becoming such as Paul the Aged, <laughs> who was somewhere in his mid 50s, and is now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. One of the things I'm often struck by by Paul, though, when he talks about bear on my body the marks of Christ Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be like to be the Apostle Paul and undress in front of the mirror and look in the mirror? This guy who was lashed and stoned left for dead. I am often struck by that. Just the concept. We read it, you know, so he was left for dead and the next morning he got up and went into the city. <laughs> you know? He says, I mean, would I be going back into the city? I mean, I would be nursing myself for the next six months trying to recover from being almost dead. All of his fingers away. And head back into the city and we'll see what happens. Paul's way of establishing himself was at crossroads. That's the way God worked. That's what Pentecost was. Pentecost was when people from all over the known world came to Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit spoke to people in their own languages. And they wound up going worldwide just as they scattered out. And so Paul, when we're going to be looking at maps, but Paul ministered in Tarsus, which is a crossroads for up in Cilicia. Then he was in Antioch of Syria with Barnabas and company. Then he went to Corinth, which we'll see that as a, as a shipping channel where they crossed over through. And Ephesus, which is a huge crossroads in Asia. From Ephesus, Paul established churches that never saw him because people would get the word from somebody visiting Ephesus would take it to Laodicea. And they would start a church there. And Paul never saw the churches that started and then finally in Rome. So he established at the crossroads where the gospel could be spread out. It appears that Paul also developed a technique of writing letters to churches and encouraging them to pass them on to others. So I'm not sure if you ever get a, a chain letter from one of the ministries who, who sends you a letter saying, this is what's happening. And so we see in Colossians 4.16, and when this letter's been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And see, you also read the letter to Laodicea. And so the copies were being sent around that some of them we're going to see are very, very personal, and some of them are not as personal. Paul said, send these around. Just make sure that they go from one place to another and you share the letters. Antioch. So the church at Antioch, Antiochus was the name of the royal Syrian family for about 200 years. So when a large city was built or renamed, a favorite name was Antioch. And such as, much as, much as Caesarea was later, there's a bunch of Caesareas and there's a bunch of Antiochs. And so this is an overview of Antioch today. There were 15 different cities named Antioch. One in Asia where Paul founded the church in Acts 13. The other was the base for the church missionary movement to the Gentiles. Antioch developed a very interesting group of leaders. So in Acts 13, 1, 
we see now there were at the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers such as. And so here are the leaders in the church at Antioch. Barnabas. Simeon that was called Niger. Niger. And Lucius of Cyrene and Mananon who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So this is a, a childhood friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. I'm, not sure. I'm, I'm a picture person. I, I like pictures in my mind. And so if I teach properly, I develop pictures that can be passed on to your minds as well. And so I have a picture in my mind of what the early church looked like. But when I look at this church, it's entirely different than what that picture in my mind is. This is from the New Living. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas and Simeon called the black man. Hmm, so I wonder why they called him the black man. Maybe because he was a black man. Lucius from Cyrene. Cyrene is mostly black. And so, man on the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and so on. So one can assume Simeon was black. There was also Lucius, Lucius of Cyrene. Cyrene was the capital of Cyrenaica, a Roman district in northern Africa. Okay, let's make some connections here. Simon of Cyrene carried the cross. Now, he may well have become a Christian since he's identified as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why, why would you say Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, if nobody knew Alexander and Rufus? So he obviously said father of Alexander and Rufus because people knew him. And so Simon of Cyrene was the father of Alexander and Rufus, who were known to the people that Mark wrote to. And so in the NIV, it says a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Uh, I had mentioned earlier on that Mark is written to the Romans. So look at this one. Romans 16, 13. Greet Rufus. Hmm. Chosen in the Lord and his mother, who has become a mother to me too. So there's a good chance that one of the leaders of the church at Antioch was Simon of Cyrene, who was a black man. He had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Rufus was a brother that Paul greeted the church at Antioch was an interracial church. It's quite possible that while at Antioch, Rufus, Paul stayed with the black family to the point that Simon, Simeon's wife became like a mother to the young preacher. To me, I think that is like super cool. We have Paul living with this black family. Simon's or Simeon's wife got so close that she was like a mother to Paul and it wasn't worth talking about. That racial stuff was just not an issue. It was not an issue to the point that they worked side by side and nobody really cared as long as the work got done. Oh man. Uh, hopefully I can get through this. Uh, so while they're at Antioch, a prophet came from Jerusalem predicting a famine in Acts 11, 27. At that time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. And it's the same Agabus that shows up in Paul's last missionary journey. While we're staying there for several days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us and took Paul's belt, bound in his own hands and feet with it, and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, This is the way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt, will hand him over to the Gentiles. So, this prophet Agabus came up to Antioch and talked to the people there and said, There is a famine coming in Jerusalem. And so the church at Antioch made a decision and says, uh, So the disciples, in verse 29, determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so. 
sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they took Barnabas and Saul and sent them down to Jerusalem with the offering. But apparently there was something else going on. Let's see where I go here. Oh, there's a good chance that they say, remember, okay, so, so we came to Maine. You, you may have figured out that we're not sleeping like in a cornfield somewhere. Why? Because we have family that we love here. And so we are staying with Ashley and Kenny. And there's a good chance that Paul and Barnabas stayed with Barnabas' Aunt Mary. We see in Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus, he's sending greetings. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So you have to do a little bit of family <coughs> math here and say, okay, so if Mark is the cousin of Barnabas, that means his mother, Mary, is the aunt of, Bar of Barnabas. And so there's a good chance that they stayed with Aunt Mary. In Acts 12, 11, and again, this, this is how you weave things together. As you said, I didn't realize that this is all happening. So Barnabas and, and, and Saul of Tarsus are in Jerusalem. While they're in Jerusalem, James, the brother of John, is executed. Peter is thrown in prison. And guess what? He falls asleep. Another thing that Peter is sleeping through. So he is sleeping in his jail cell. An angel comes along and says, Peter, Peter, hey Peter. <laughs> what Peter really needed was a dog to jump on him, to wake him up. We, we have that for, for David. We need to have a dog now for David to wake David up at home. Uh, when Peter came to himself, so he is led outside of the, of the jail, and Peter this whole time thinks it's a vision. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of J John, whose other name was Mark, where many would gather together praying. Probably Paul and Barnabas were in that gathering because they were probably staying with Aunt Mary and they were probably in that house with that house church. Keep in mind for tomorrow when we get there is that this church, this house church had a very tight connection to Peter. Uh, this is the same trip to Jerusalem from Paul's perspective in the book of Galatians. Then after 14 years, this is after being in the wilderness in uh, uh, Arabia. I want to begin to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. Now, he's not mentioned. There is a theory behind that that I kind of go along with that Titus and Luke were actually brothers. And so Titus is not mentioned in Luke's writings because he just doesn't want to get family involved. Trivia, a trivia thing, that in the book of John, James is never mentioned. John's brother James is never mentioned in the book of John because he does, and John himself doesn't mention his own name in the book of John. And so they go to Jerusalem and it says they took Titus along with them as well. They went up in response to a revelation. So that, that's the uh, Agabus' uh, prophecy of, of the famine. Then I laid before them in private meetings with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, and skipped down through and it says, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles, that they should be circumcised, and we are out of time, and I will not run over time tonight at least. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Father and God, we come before you, thanking you for this day, for this Lord's Day, a chance to worship you in the morning and again in the evening. Thank you for the gospel that you have sent out, and pray that you would take the same gospel that went out to the Gentiles through the hands of the Apostle Paul, and take that same gospel and put it to those that are in Lewiston and places around. Guide us as we go through our beginning of a week tomorrow, and as we regather tomorrow evening. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.